Let us, without further ado, talk to Helen Dale uh, about a great many things. Helen, a very good morning to you. Good morning to you, Mike. How are you? I'm very well indeed. I'm feeling good this week because despite some people's kind of uh, trepidation, shall we say, about Boris Johnson's um, roadmap plan, I'm, I'm encouraged that we're sort of, it feels as though we're starting to move in the right direction. You know, there's people talking about the Reading Festival going ahead, people talking about, you know, restaurants opening up at some point, schools opening up. It feels like we're kind of on the, uh, on the downward slide, if you like, from the, the peak. I think so. Yes, it's the it's clear that the vaccines are working. Yes. I mean, I said this last week, but now we've actually got data, British data, not just Israeli data to show how effective they are. So the vaccines are clearly working. And uh, uh, and I think Boris Johnson got burnt badly in two directions. First, with uh, eat out to help out, which was too quick. Mm. And then when he was bounced into the second lockdown because there was a leak. And so you had that sense of a government flailing. Yeah, and the, the, the various problems, and I've talked about this a few times on, on, my, on your, the Independent Republic, mm. of uh, low state capacity. But Britain has started to find its historic state capacity. You know, this, this, this was the, the civilization that, that had this enormous empire and so on and so forth. And you can't do those things unless you're competent. No. And it started to find the state capacity first with the Brexit deal. Lord Frost did a terrific job of that. And now with the vaccine rollout. Although I will say that if the NHS was designed for anything, it is for a vaccine rollout. And it really is doing it with military precision. Yes. I mean, I must say, I've been, I think, probably like most people, very, very pleasantly surprised that we have, in fact, proven ourselves to be world beating, uh, despite the fact that we often say that we're world beating. We're not always. But but in this instance, no. I mean, I was <laughs> looking at uh, the German newspaper Bild this morning, uh, which is saying they're envious of us because they've literally only vaccinated 4% of their population. And they're now worried that in Germany there might be another spike because they haven't got enough vaccinations to go around. And in that case, you can genuinely, you can't blame the Germans or Angela Merkel for this. You genuinely have to sheet that one home to the European Union. And even Guy Verhofstadt was popping off on Twitter yesterday saying we have absolutely, excuse my French, screwed the pooch on this. Yeah. You know, the, the Brits negotiated a proper contract and, the, and there's watertight drafting and we stuffed it up. And as a, a, a friend of mine who's also, like me, qualified in both common law and Roman law, I saw him make the point yesterday that it's not a flaw. A few people were, were saying, oh, common law is better than Roman law. And that's not actually the issue. There are very, very good contractual draftsmen in Roman law or civilian systems that have been going back to antiquity. I can show you Roman Empire period contracts that are beautifully drafted and that modern lawyers look at them and go, good job. <laughs> it, it is literally a case of the European Union not getting the best people for the job to do this. And he made the co comment, if it were a French arms supplier or a German car de dealer doing this, the job would have been done properly. Mm. Well, and that kind of highlights the, the difficulty of running a federal state, which is what the, U uh, the EU yes. think they're trying to do, even though they're not very good at it. Um, because you've spoken before about the way that Australia works, and we'll come to that in a moment. But, but you know, the way that they are not really built for speed, they're not really built for um, detail, really, because they they're get bogged... They're not bogged... built for detail or nimbleness. No, they get bogged down in both of those things, um, which is, uh, which is you know, the enemy of progress, I think, in all, in all matters. So... Now, I think that the, I wonder if the, the, the individual states of the EU will try and separate themselves a little bit more legally in terms of uh, the way that they draft legislation and the way that they get things done, because they don't really want to rely on an organisation that can't organise. Well, that's basically the problem. Federalism, it, it's becoming increasingly clear. And just to move on to your next point with with uh, uh, the Australian system, uh, Australia is a federal system, so is Germany, and they're mm. both very well-run countries. Uh, the United States is a federal system, and it's not a well-run country. Right. Federalism does require high state capacity, and it's become very clear that the European Union is an entity separate completely from the individual uh, member states of the European Union, which, of course, vary enormously. There are lots of them. They're all very different. They're different cultures and histories. But the EU as an entity struggles with state capacity, and that was exposed quite has been exposed very badly with the vaccine procurement stuff up mm, exactly right and it's interesting isn't it because um, when you look at the US system they almost seem to be overburdened with red tape in a different yes. way 
because the way that their, their states are structured um, seem to be overladen um, with representation, don't they? Well, yes, they're overgoverned. And I mean, Australians sometimes complain that they're overgoverned, but Americans are overgoverned in this really petty, petty fogging, awful way. Yeah. The thing that always stuns me every time I go to the US is occupational licensing. Mm. You know, you have to get a special qualification and do so many hours of work experience to do the braiding, you know, that lovely, those lovely braids oh, yeah. that a lot of African Americans yes. wear. You know, and this is the kind of thing, I mean, I can do it because I've got very curly hair. I used to do it to myself when I was a kid to keep it off my face when I was playing sport. And the thing is, it's the kind of thing that your mum or your relatives teach you. It's right. not the kind of thing you learn in a, in a university course or something. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Well, do you know, I heard you know. another one of those crazy things last night. I was talking to my sister in Connecticut, where she lives, where they've now put in a property tax on cars, right? So when you buy a car... You, have, you don't pay VAT in the same way that we do. They have a sales tax, but you also have a property tax on a car that you own or you lease on the basis that it is worth property money to you as an individual, which seems to me to be a mass, massive overreach for a place. When I first lived in America, Connecticut didn't even have any income tax at uh, state level. Yes, I know. It's just, it's really quite strange. And, and this is why, I mean, I've been fielding questions all week on this, and that's why I wrote at very short notice for Reaction, mm. uh, Ian Martin's magazine, that piece on Australia v Facebook. But it wasn't just Australia v Facebook. That's only about a third of the article. I also wanted to deal with well how, how has Australia managed to come out at the other end of a trade war with China smelling like roses and steaming out of a recession yeah. and how has Australia managed to make manage coronavirus so well and so I finished up having to deal with the fact that you know Australia spent five years using the ACCC the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission which is their regulator for competition law yeah. um, uh, spent five years working out how to design this legislation. It was designed and drafted with very great care. And I know from being involved in parliamentary drafting while I was working in Canberra, in Parliament House for the politician I was working for, I was involved in the marriage equality legislation mm. in Australia. The care with which the Australian system takes with the development of policy um, I mean, I, I saw it being described over here as a link tax, and I was thinking, no, it's not link tax. It won't be a link tax. So I went and looked at the, the regs, and of course it's not a link tax. It's an, it's, what it does is it uses the arbitration framework that is actually built into Australia's constitution mm. and was historically used to uh, set wage, wage rates, which are known as awards in Australia. It's, Australia doesn't have a minimum wage. It has lots and lots of little minimum wages across different industries, and these are known as awards. Okay. And how do and they so, differentiate between who gets what at a minimum wage level then? Basic combination of things, they'd use age. So uh, very young people are paid quite a lot less before they turn 21 mm. in Australia and the wage is gradually increased. So that's within an industry. And then across the industries, uh, it's determined uh, partly through negotiation with the unions, partly through how much skill is involved in the occupation and partly on existing history in terms of involvement in in large complex projects mm. so so you've got this arbitration framework and that is what has been done to the tech giants so they, they they've been fed into the, this very traditional australian system and conciliation and arbitration is a head of power in the constitution that was set up in 1901 mm. And it's always worked well. Yes, Australia well, it seems to have worked had... well in this case as well, because it seems as though yes. certainly Facebook, who looked like they were kicking off about it, have kind of uh, buckled under. Well, yes, what it is, is Amazon tried this as well, or in that case, although in Amazon's case, they took on the Australian Taxation Office, which mm. is the Aussie equivalent of HMLC, whereas in this case, they've taken on effectively the government in the form of the constitutional arbitration power that it's got. And... Uh, what they perhaps did not realise, and certainly Google didn't realise, which is why they buckled very quickly, mm. is that Australia will just say, all right, if you don't like it here, go. Yeah. And they'll do that to immigrants and they'll do it to corporations. A lot of people don't realise that's yeah. a completely consistent cultural attitude that the country just ha happens to have towards people who, who want to work in Australia, mm. which was why when I wrote 
couple of months ago, a piece for Standpoint. It was very much about Australian rules. Yes. Australians and it's have interesting. a very clear sense of themselves as, as a as a rule driven society. Yes. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because in our in our country, in our society, that probably to a lot of people would be anathema because, you know, we get the opposite um, as a kind of narrative that we're very welcoming here in the UK and we want to welcome anyone who comes here. And if you don't have that belief, then you must be some kind of horrible racist, fascist, nationalist, flag waving maniac. Whereas in well, Australia... I mean, as I've pointed out to quite a few people, one of the reasons why you've had so many lockdowns in this country and they've been so appalling is precisely because Britain didn't close the borders. Right. You yeah. Know, I've had Australian friends say, my goodness, the UK wasted its island status, didn't it? Mm. So well, this is it. I mean, as recently as, as, as recently as just before the borders were properly shut, um, 50,000 people a week were coming into Heathrow Airport. And I mean, that was just before Christmas. I mean, I went to meet my, my own daughter coming in from Dubai, uh, watching planes coming in from China, you know, from all parts of Africa, all over the world. Planes were arriving literally every sort of 10 minutes. And I'm going, I'm sorry, I thought we were in the middle of a pandemic. Where are all these people yes. going? Yes, well, as uh, and Australia used Nassim Taleb's argument that lockdowns are what happen when quarantine fails. Yeah. So if you don't want lockdowns, you have to have quarantine, basically. Mm. Um, and the only Australian state to have any lock serious lockdown was, of course, Victoria. And what happened there? They had problems with their mm. hotel quarantine system. Yes. What about so, the uh, the future for um, for for sort of uh, social media companies like Facebook? Um, and other high tech, big tech companies, because this is quite a line in the sand that Australia have drawn, isn't it? Well, I have been hearing on the Bush Telegraph and even seen some news reports that the U European Union has is effectively borrowing a bit of Australia's state capacity because its directive for uh, its digital directive doesn't work. Mm. And they've always struggled with it. They've got real problems with it. So now you, but and because all the legislation is just there and the ACCC's report is there, you've literally because it's the laws of physics with te technology like this, you can literally just pick up the Australian system and drop it in other countries. So it wouldn't surprise me to see first the EU, because they've been wanting to do this for a while and they haven't been able to, but then perhaps other jurisdictions mm. taking the Australian system, modifying it to suit their local conditions and then, and then making use of that, of that system it's just, uh, I mean, you cannot have uh, uh, corporations, and this is, I mean, it's extraordinary to see left-wing people su supporting big tech against a sovereign state, mm. but you cannot have corporations telling sovereign states and democratically elected governments how to run their internal affairs. That's no. just not acceptable. No. And this was the year, wasn't it, I suppose? And when I say the year, I suppose I mean 2020, um, in which these big companies thought that they were kind of supranational, that they were hmm. astride the world like behemoths, you know, that the Colossus of Rhodes was actually, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. And you just think, yeah. well, no, that's not what we're going to let you do. Well, no, and it does become it becomes the, a classic case of, and you could use the the, the, the little one liner that um, that uh, quite a lot of people in Australia do, which is to Mark Z to Zuckerberg and to um, to uh, the the Google, Google board yeah. is very much along the lines of who elected you, mm. and that does matter. That is yes. hugely hugely important. Well, in our uh, conversation, which will be going out uh, hopefully later today, Toby Young, Christopher Snowden, talking about freedom of speech and freedom of expression in the future and how Toby Young raised this idea that, you know, he's worried that if YouTube and the like can somehow make it impossible for you to say certain things on their channel, you know, what happens when that moves into another uh, a sphere? Say, for example, uh, they don't like what you might say about climate change and therefore you can't then put a video up on their, on their uh, platform. Well, I do think it is significant that one of the things that Facebook did is exposed itself as being terribly incompetent mm. and cat handed in Australia. A lot of people have got the idea and had got the idea in their head that these tech giants were much more competent than sovereign governments mm. and could just run circles around them. And, you know, had this idea that they were all seeing and all knowing and all competent. And when Facebook pulled news from Australian uh, from its 
a, its own pages, a, effectively. Australian pages. Yeah. They didn't just do that. They wiped out the Queensland Department of Health. They took all the coronavirus let, um, advice down, which is different in Australia from here, for, for, as we've discussed. Mm. They, they also took down all the bushfire alerts from the Country Fire Authority <laughs> and the Country right. Fire Service, right. which in a country like Australia is actively dangerous. Now, a friend of mine in Australia, Stephen Barrett, is a firefighter, and he said they have their own internal software that provides alerts within the uh, within the country fire service and the country fire authority yeah. but the problem is they were using facebook to get information out to remote communities if they were at risk yeah. and he he told me he said the day that that facebook did that was the day of in two states south australia and new south wales of the highest fire danger for the whole year mm. so far I know. So, well, I mean, really, well, I mean, anyone really could tell. A lot of people. Well, of course, and anyone could tell you, Helen, that anyone who thinks hiring Nick Clegg's a good idea is clearly not on the right side of history, uh, or indeed intelligence. But that's another matter. Let's talk briefly uh, before we go about this uh, uh, business of anonymous Twitter accounts and, and anon anonymity uh, that you wrote about um, in uh, Law and Liberty this week. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, basically, what Law and Liberty, uh, I've taken a job there, uh, uh, basically a part time role as a senior writer. And they asked me, do you want to write a review of one of the Titania McGrath books? Mm. And I said, well, it's not just a book. It's a phenomenon of people who use parody Twitter accounts. And Titania McGrath is just the most famous of them. And so I provided the history of how Twitter has always tolerated parody accounts of politicians. As long as you clear, clearly mark them as parody, they won't delete you, you won't get zapped. Mm. And I mean, and some of them are enormously popular. I found the one that uh, the, the Vladimir Putin ripoff, there's a parody account of Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And it's got more followers than you and I added together. <laughs> I mean, these these have always been a thing. Yes. But well, funnily enough, there's about four parody uh, Twitter accounts of me, believe it or not. Yes. And some, oh, of, them, yes. some of them are even funnier than I am. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> but but what Andrew Doyle did, and the thing is, he didn't start this. Andrew Doyle wasn't the first person to do this. There were other people who did it. There's a comedian who I've actually seen who is very good. Her name is Lisa Graves, who's also a graphic designer. And mm. she actually designed the, the cartoon face of T Titania McGrath for Andrew. Right. Now, she was Godfrey Elfwick. Okay. The genderqueer Muslim atheist. Yeah. And the thing is, she got banned. For and being offensive? Some, yeah, for being offensive. And she set up several others, and they've all been banned as well. Mm. And there was this period where you didn't know whether Titania McGrath was going to stay there or not be there anymore, because it is very clear that Twitter has a problem as a corporate entity with satire of a personality type. Yes. They can deal with the satire of a real person, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, Keir Starmer, there are yeah. fake account, and I'm sure there are for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris yeah. as well, but I haven't looked. But I'm sure they will exist. And like you've got four, I mean, these world leaders have probably got 30 each. Yes, or something. I imagine so. Uh, and uh, so it's clear the problem they struggle with is the personality type. Mm. Now, what Titania McGrath does, so, what Doyle does with her so well, is this very, very posh, clueless woman. Mm who thinks she's punching up and saving the world and and being a radical intersectional intersectionalist slam poet when you know she lives in Kensington and right. has a country estate in the But Cotswolds. I mean the great thing about good parody is that it's very close to the reality of the world and that's why it's funny because she actually could be if you read it in a particular way uh, as ridiculous as many of the real people uh, who tweet out about those same kinds of things, virtue signals well, in particular. Well, that's why Andrew Doyle was quite cross, and I wrote about this in my piece for Law and Liberty, and I quoted him on it. He was quite cross when his cover was blown because he wanted people, and there were a, before she was before he was outed, there were a percentage of people who thought she was real and would get into enormous Twitter arguments with her. Mm. And yeah, and it was actually very funny because it became that thing. There's this the, 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 there's this expression known as Poe's law, yeah. which is where some parody is so close to the real thing you can't tell the difference. Exactly. And so people engage <laughs> with the parody as though as though it's real. Yes. And that's well, I think we've probably all fallen victim. Outed. We've probably all fallen victim to it, where you pick something up. There's one of an MP which is particularly funny, um, and people fall for it all the time because they assume Hi. it's a real MP, uh, and she comes out with some ludicrous stuff, and people start attacking her for it. And you know. And you, it's not. And it's not, but it's actually not that far from what some MPs would have said, you know? Mm. 
So it's so quite he's fun. Very, very, he's very clever. And this is the one, this little book is the one supposedly for kids. And it's even done like a traditional kids book. You know, it's got a wipeable cover. You know how, because, <laughs> yeah, six yes. and seven year olds have yeah, got sticky fingers it, yes. and they put their sticky fingers all mm. over book covers. Yeah. And, and so it's got this wipeable cover. And I, when I was doing research for the Law and Liberty piece, I found the books that, the Titania McGrath character names, all these sort of very woke kids' books. I thought they were all jokes. Mm. And then I went on the Waterstones and Blackwell's websites and thought, I would just better check this or otherwise I'll drop myself in it in an, interna- in an American publication that's got a lot more readers than a lot of the publications yeah. I write for over here. And so I, che- I looked them up at Waterstones. I know they're real books. There are people out in the world. This is what I mean about not being able to tell the difference between Titania mm. and the real stuff. I know. These books actually exist, and I'm just sitting there going, oh, my goodness me, this is bananas. It really is unbelievable stuff. Helen, great to talk to you once more. We're out of time, I'm afraid. Helen Dale uh, with her take on the way that Facebook has been beaten down uh, by the Australian government, rather cleverly, I'd have to say, and also about the whole uh, parody account business and humour and all of the rest of the stuff that social media seems to be incapable of understanding is quite remarkable, is it not?